Testing, testing. Okay, good. Uh, welcome to CS4510, the last day of class. Uh, today's topic is on the polynomial hierarchy. Polynomial hierarchy. Uh, the first half of today's lecture is going to be just on the definition of this weird object, and then the second half is going to talk about why do we care about it. So the first half, only definitions, and then we'll talk about its importance. The polynomial hierarchy, so what is it? It is a weird kind of uh, arcane device that is unlike the other complexity classes because it looks weird. Um, yet it, we will talk about, uh, it probably has a harder definition than any of the other classes combined. But, and today we're going to give three defin de uh, different definitions of it. Um, but given that, it also has a uh, deep connections to these other classes. So, you know, sometimes you can just make up something and then talk about problems concerning it, and then, you know, maybe that's like a strategy to publish a paper or something. Uh, so the polynomial hierarchy has itself open questions, uh, but it's not just, that's not its own interest. That's not the interest of it. It's, to me personally, it's rather the connections to the other, other classes. Um, and it has a very different uh, feel than the rest of the classes. So first, um, let's talk about P as a class. P as a class uh, is defined using this kind of logical definition. We say W is in L, uh, if and only if, and L is in P, right? If L is a language in P, if and only if, M on W accepts. Right, so we give an M runs in polynomial time. So M is a machine. And M runs in uh, polynomial time. And it accepts the word W uh, in a polynomial number of steps. We can define this operation. So we put this existential quantifier. Uh, there exists C to be uh, if to modify the definition of uh, C. Uh, so that uh, L is in exists C if uh, W is in L, if and only if there exists X uh, such that M on W X accepts and uh, M is a C machine. So M has property C. Exists C is we modify the definition of C so that it has to accept X, some X, if there exists an X as well. This is the definition of exists C. So given that, what does exist P? So exists P would be W is an L, and L would be an exists P, if there exists an X such that M is a polynomial time machine. What is, the, what is another name for exists P? So what is another name for exist P? Exist P would be, uh, just to be clear, W, is, it has the definition. We, what we're going to do is take a logical definition of the language and then modify them, right? So the definition of exist P is W is an L, if and only if, there exists an X which can convince a, uh, can convince a polynomial time machine M uh, to accept. And M runs in polynomial time. I don't see how this is just, isn't different than just, or I don't see how this isn't different from just the definition of P. Well, P has to decide M just by M. But here, M, this M is allowed to take on another argument, and that may help it decide P if W is an L. It's like an advice kind of thing? Exactly, but what's the, there's a better characterization of exist P that we know. Exist P is NP. Why? M is now not a solver, a decider, but a verifier. X is a witness of, by the way, polynomial size, and M takes on the witness, and it uses the witness to tell it if it accepts or rejects, right? So um, basically, you can think of NP like a modified logical definition of P, where we add this existential quantification to the definition of P. P has this definition. Then if you just throw this X, exist X there, suddenly it's a larger class. It's NP. What is, so if this is exist P, what is exists exist P? 
So just to be clear, exists exists P, is W is an L, if and only if, uh, there exists x1, there exists x2, such that M, M, W, x1, x2, accepts. Does that do anything, or is it kind of like... Does it do anything? I feel like it wouldn't. So we have two. We now have two polynomial-sized witnesses. That's just so, one big polynomial-sized witness. So exists, 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 exists p. Is it? We, we can write it this way. Exists, exists p is equal to exists p, which is equal to n p, right? And there's probably a better argument I could make um, for this one. So like, um, certainly. Certainly, everything exists P is in exists, exists P. So let's try and prove that exists, exists is a subset of exists, right? So what you can do is, like, the way you would argue this is, like, you could say, okay, I take mon one um, witness, and then I break it up into two polynomial size witnesses, and then I run the exists, exists machine. That would perform the simulation. But certainly, it's believable, right? And certainly, then, exists K uh, p is equal to exists p, right? So actually, having many, many existential quantifiers, all of polynomial size, is just the same as having one, okay? Now, what about um, for all p? For all p is defined in a similar way, where we say w is in L, if and only if, uh, for all x, m, w, given x, etc. Notice, though, that a negated for all is kind of like exists, right? Actually, it is. So we could take, let's take the definition of exists P and then negate it, right? If we took the definition of exists, we took negated exists P, we would get uh, W is not an L, or rather that W is an L complement, right? If and only if there does not exist X, such that M, W, X rejects, which is this. This is just then for all X, M on W, X rejects. Now, here I'm going to do something that doesn't count as negation. We say re rejects here, but I don't care about the rejecting. We care about the accepting. So just change the coordinate basis and pretend that this says accepts. And we don't negate that part because it's arbitrary. So certainly it feels like a language, if a language is in ex exists P, then its complement has to be in for all p, right? So, um, so L is in exists p uh, if and only if the complement of L is in uh, for all p. So we know that exists p is np. We also have a name for for all p. We haven't said it out loud though, but there is a name for it. You know, maybe you know what the name is. No, it's um, actually going to be co-NP. And you may remember we defined co to be exactly this, the languages which are the complements um, for the recognizable languages. Like we had decidable, then we had recognizable, and then we had co-recognizable, right? Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we have a picture. Actually, I can do it here. I have plenty of room. We have a picture of the world, okay? So we have P. Then we have what appears to be NP, right? But we also, but then co NP looks like this. Right? So certainly P is a subset of NP the same reason that P is a subset of co-NP. And the situation, the, the, the hostage we're in, with the relationship between P and NP, we have a similar relationship with both P and co-NP and co-NP and NP, right? So it turns out that the existential quantifier is a really good um, representative of the class NP, and the universal quantifier is a really good representative of the class of co-NP. To give you an argument why, uh, Let's talk about why uh, 
the existential quantifier is pretty good for NP, right? We have a non-deterministic machine, and it accepts when, if there exists a, compu a, a computation path, right? Exists a branch, and it rejects when, uh, for all branches, none accept. Right? So recall the non-deterministic machine. If there exists a branch, it accepts. If all branches reject, then the machine rejects. Right? Um, but there's also some other characterizations of uh, existential characterizations of NP. For example, SAT. We say phi is in SAT uh, if there exists an assignment. Right? You just have to find one assignment. So there exists an assignment, then phi is in SAT. So the NP-complete problem also ha can be existentially quantified, right, if there exists an assignment. Meanwhile, um, the universal quantifier is kind of like co-NP, right? So we actually have something called uh, co-non-determinism. Uh, and it accepts only if all branches... Except, and it rejects if there exists a branch to reject. So a co-non-deterministic machine has to have all branches accept. And it rejects if there exists a path which rejects. Similarly, there is a co-NP-complete problem, which is kind of like the villain version of SAT. It's called tautologies. And tautologies is basically CNF formulas, phi, such that... Um, Every assignment of phi is satisfying. It's kind of like the complement of sat, right? So imagine a formula where every single assignment is satisfying. Then it's, a, it's called a tautology, and it's in tautologies. Tautologies is co-NP complete, like sat is NP complete. So Certainly, the universal quantifier is a good representation of SAT, of, of co-NP. It's like its team flag or mascot or badge. And the, univ the existential quantifier is for NP. Um, why don't we think that tautologies, the reason we think co-NP and NP are different like this and not the same is because we think that SAT is not in co-NP and that tautologies is not in NP, right? So recall, if something is in NP, it can be quickly verified, right? There exists a deterministic verifier. So SAT is in NP because you can, you, what is the witness, right? You can easily produce a witness, and the witness witnesses something. It convinces a deterministic verifier. It's a solution. So you say, oh, here's the actual assignment. I'm now convinced that the formula was satisfiable because you displayed to me it's satisfiable. What, is it, what could possibly be a witness for tautology? How do you prove the tautology? You can prove something's not a tautology by showing uh, an assignment which it, it's not satisfying. How do you prove for all assignments? What is a short? There's no short proof that all assignments satisfy a tautology, satisfy a CNF, right? So we're pretty sure tautologies is not in NP. The same reason we believe that uh, SAT is not in co-NP, right? And these are really the same class, but just. You know, there's like a yin-yang thing going on, right? Um, P, though, certainly is a subset of both, right? If NP was closed under complement, then by definition, NP would equal co-NP. But that doesn't say anything about P. Uh, and we're not even sure that if NP equals co-NP, we think that, there, that the intersection of NP and co-NP is not uh, just P. So this little area here, this little teardrop shape, is if it's in here, it's both an NP and co-NP. That means it's closed under complement. So this little teardrop shape is closed under complement. P is closed under complement, because if you can decide yes or no in polynomial time, you can decide no or yes in polynomial time. But we don't think that, um, we're not necessarily sure that just because it's an NP and closed under complement, a specific language, that it means it's in P. There are a few examples, and there are a few NP intermediate examples that we can come up with such that it appears that there is a short proof of 
it being in the language, it's either satisfiable or it's a tautology, something like this, right? Um, to give you the one I know, I think it's like primes, right? So how do you prove a number is composite? You display its factorization, and then you show the factors can be multiplied polynomial time, and then therefore it's not, it's a composite number. The, the dual of composites would be primes. And although we won't talk about it, there is a short way to prove that a number is prime. Uh, primes is in NP. This is the result from the 70s. You can exhibit a short proof that a number is prime. Uh, don't want to get into that, but you can believe that it's possible. That kind of evidence was also destroyed in like 2004 when someone finally gave a deterministic primality testing uh, algorithm. So you could prove that, an, uh, that, that actually primes was not just in this, maybe this middle zone, but in P, and therefore composites also in P. So uh, that kind of example is more of a historic one. But we, it's not necessarily true that P is equal to the intersection of NP and co-NP. That is a very open problem. Uh, I want to remark that this is a very similar structure to the one we had for the decidable and recognizable languages. If you recall, we had like decidable, like anything that is by a halting algorithm, and then it turns out that we had recognizable and co-recognizable, and that the decidable was exactly the intersection of both of those, if you recall, right? Halt was here, and then halt complement had to be here, right? And it turns out that if a language was decidable, excuse me, recognizable and co-recognizable, it had to be decidable. So for that case, uh, the difference between decidable and recognizable is kind of so there's a similar structure to the, the difference between P and NP. But this is... You can separate those by diagonalization. We don't know how to really separate these. So this is a much more different, uh, kind of a harder thing to do. OK? So similarly, uh, exists exists p is exists p. So similarly, what is for all for all p? That's just the same thing? Yeah, it's going to be just for all p, which is going to be co and p. Right. Uh, it doesn't get more hypothetical than this. All right, here's a hard one. What do we know about for all exists P? Totally, again, hypothetical. What is for all exists P? Uh, this is the class that's defined like W is in L, and of course L is in for all exists P. If and only if, um, for all x1, there exists x2, uh, such that M, uh, W, x1, x2 accepts. So now there are two quote-unquote witnesses, and we're going to keep calling these witnesses, even though they're not witnessing anything, because I don't know what else to call them. Uh, but they're certainly there to help the computation. Uh, for example, something that might be verifiable in polynomial time, it may not be decidable in polynomial time. So adding the quantifier certainly grows the language, certainly grows the class. It allows, you know, if you can convince someone of something rather than proving something, it's like, uh, you know, checking is faster than solving, right? So that's why NP is bigger than P. Similarly, adding these quantifiers has to grow the class. Uh, but now one is universally quantified and one is existentially quantified. So this is complicated. Uh, it turns out this is not actually uh, equal to any classes we've talked about, but it's now a secret new uh, thing. And what we're going to prove is that uh, for all p uh, is a subset of for all exists p. Uh, why is this true? For all p is a subset of for all exists p. Uh, if you have a for all p machine, then we know that it, we know that like um, a w is an l uh, if and only if. Uh, for all x, 1, uh, m, w, x, accepts. You can convert this to a for all exists machine by just having uh, a new machine check that this input is something and then just keep pretending it's the other one. So basically, you can ignore a quantifier to show that this is a restricted subset of it, right? Um, so certainly this contains, so this is bigger than co-NP. For the same reason, it's also bigger than NP, right? You can uh, ignore a quantifier, and if you ignore the quantifier, then it's true for all quantifiers, right? So certainly, like, uh, just to be clear here, uh, W is an L if and only if there exists X, 
one M W X accepts. You could make a machine W is an L if and only if uh, for all X two exists X one M prime W X one X two accepts. Now what is M prime going to do in terms of M? M prime is just going to ignore X two. If it ignores X2 and just continues what M was doing with X, X1, right, then that means it's true for all X2. So it's quantified over that, right? So back to our picture here, where does that put, um, where does that put for all exists uh, as a class? It's a superset of exists for all and for all exists, right? So what that means is it looks like this. I'll put uh, three on top. Right? It contains both co NP and NP, as we just argued, and it's certainly bigger than them. Right? But we don't know how big. Um, what about, uh, what do we think we know about uh, exists for all P? Exist for all p appears to also have to contain for all p and exist p. It also has to contain np and co np. But do we think that for all exists p has, what is the relationship you th would guess between for all exists p and exist for all p? This is a hard question. At first thought, I think they're different because I know that order matters. But is it easy to just switch x1 and x2? Turns out no. And the intuition you had is right, that it is hard because we can't switch them in general. We don't know. We can at least define them to be different. So they're going to be like this. This is going to be exists for all P, right? Um, the reason that we think that they're different happens to be the same reason that we think NP and co -NP are different. So we think NP and co -NP are different. We have this multitude of evidence that it looks like it's hard to put tautologies in NP and SAT in co -NP. Like, it just doesn't seem as possible. And these seem very different. Uh, NP should not be closed under complement. That's like the gut feeling. So similarly, this is just the, there's a mirrored argument here that we just advanced by a level. OK? We don't think these should be the same for the same reason. We sh you should not be able to permute the quantifiers in general. Uh, and that's, we don't know, though, but that's just the guess. So what about something like exists? exists for all p. This is where you start to get into keep doing it. Or like if you keep doing the same sign, it doesn't really mean much. So exactly. Like so you can compress these two quantifiers. So this is going to be exists for all p. Here's a tricky one. What about exists for all exists p? can't compress the quantifiers because they may depend on each other. So this is certainly a larger class than exists for all p, which, is also, which also happens to contain for all exists p. So we actually have a very natural hierarchy here. And uh, this, is what the, this is what the polynomial hierarchy is. We can just generalize this argument via alternating quantifiers to get a photo that looks like this. So I'm just going to draw it one time as a terrible Venn diagram. Okay, that's what it looks like, um, infinitely. Now that's kind of messy, so I'm not going to draw it like that. I'm going to draw it like this. Actually, I guess I should define it first, right? That would make the most sense. And our definition is inductive, so we're going to say uh, sigma of zero is equal to pi of 0, which is equal to p. So these are classes, and we have a base case of sigma and pi. Okay? Sigma, kind of like summing, like oring. Pi is kind of like anding, or multiplying, or existential, or universal. It's existential, right? So what we're going to do is say sigma of i is equal to exists for all, exists for all, And there's k of these, p, excuse me, i, right? You have i quantifiers, but the first one is existential. 
Similarly, you can probably guess that pi of i is going to be equal to uh, for all exists, for all exists, dot, 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 p. And this happens also i times. So these are these two classes, right? And we don't think pi i equals sigma i for the same reason that we don't think um, np equals co np, right? So we have the following. Among these classes, we now have infinitely many two hierarchies of classes, pi i, sigma i. And they each represent some alternating quantification of these. We really don't care about the alternating ones because we can compress sequential ones, right? Pol two polynomials is still a polynomial, something like this. Um, but what is the relationship between the sigma i's and the pi i's? So we have the following. To justify the Venn diagram that I'm going to draw, we have the following four relations. Uh, for all i, notice that sigma i uh, is a subset of sigma i plus 1. Do we agree with that one? Uh, pi of i is a subset of pi of i plus 1. For a similar reason, they both have this duality. They share a lot of symmetry. Uh, sigma of i is a subset of pi of i plus 1. And pi of i is a subset of the next sigma. So pi, sigma is a subset of the next pi, and pi is a subset of the next sigma. Similar to that picture with NP and co-NP that we had. Those four statements are true. Now, if I want to draw a Venn diagram, there's too many lines going around. So instead, I'm going to draw, instead of circles that overlap for area, I'm just going to draw arrows. So at the bottom here, we have pi uh, zero is equal to P, which is also happens to be the base case for sigma, right? This is the base case. Now I'm going to draw sigma on the right here. So we have sigma one. And sigma one we know is exists P. And exists P was NP. So we know that sigma one is NP. Right? And we know that P is a subset of NP. So I'm going to draw this. This arrow means P is a subset of NP. Over here, we have pi 1. Pi 1 is going to go here. Okay, pi 1 is there. What do we know about pi 1? It's a little too high. I want to make it perfect. Pi 1 was co NP, right? Because pi i is just one quantifier with starting with an existential, with the universal one. So it's just going to be. Uh, for all p. And we know that p is a subset of co-np, right? Now, what about sigma 2? Sigma 2 I'm going to draw here. We know that sigma 1 is contained in sigma 2. And we know that pi 1 is also contained in sigma 2, right? We proved that uh, for all p was in, I didn't draw it here, but for all p is in exists for all p. So we get this kind of crossing arrow here. And then pi 2 has a similar behavior where pi 1 is contained in pi 2, and sigma 1 is contained in pi 2. You see the symmetry pattern that's evoking here? I'm going to draw a few more levels of it. Pi 3 and pi 4. That is the polynomial hierarchy. That's why it looks so weird. Uh, now, this is only the first four levels of the polynomial hierarchy, but imagine uh, countably infinitely many classes like this. Each is, there's a, there's a pair of stilts on each side of this pillar, the left and the right, and they hold up the whole pillar together. So any questions on this definition of the polynomial hierarchy, what it is? Uh, not yet why we care about it, because we're going to do that in a second. But this is, the def this is what the polynomial hierarchy looks like. Uh, and this is how it's defined. It's defined recursively, or excuse me, inductively using these alternating quantifiers. Right? Immediately, you should be convinced of, of something. For example, a sigma i is equal, if it starts with an existential quantifier, then the substring of the quantifiers before it is a universal starting one. So actually, sigma i is equal to uh, sigma, 
excuse me, sigma i is equal to exists pi of i minus 1. Is that believable? Similarly, uh, you can define this as like pi of i is equal to for all sigma i. Right. So you can actually build the next class using adding a quantifier to the previous one. Right. So take pi of i, add an existential quantifier, you're going to get sigma i. If you add, a, if you add a, the same quantifier to this one, you're going to stay in this class. But by adding more quantifiers, you can increase the power. The motivation for the polynomial hierarchy is that it's sometimes ex NP and co-NP are not sufficient to define certain problems, right? NP and co-NP represent problems that can be characterized by a single quantifier, like SAD is characterized by a single quantifier, the, ex the ex existential one, and then now we know tautology is, quanti is quantified by the single universal quantifier. But sometimes a problem just naturally defines it to have many quantifiers. Uh, and so that's the motivation behind the polynomial hierarchy definition, is that certain objects, certain problems appear to lie at harder levels of P and NP, at these kinds of infinitely many generalizations, uh, certainly. All right, let's move on to the second definition of the polynomial hierarchy. This is a definition that uses oracles. So you can actually define the levels of the polynomial hierarchy using oracles uh, to the previous level. So I claim the following is true. Uh, here's an oracle definition, uh, second def. And we're not going to prove it's equivalent to the first one, but we'll try to argue in its favor. Uh, sigma 0 is equal to pi 0 is equal to p, right? So we have some sort of base case always. Um, and then I claim that sigma i is equal to the class np with an oracle to a problem in the previous class, so sigma i minus 1. Now, normally we've talked about oracles. We put a language here and not a class. But we're going to conflate the idea here because we're going to put a complete problem. Each, each level of the hierarchy has a complete problem, which is complete only for that class. So this by this, we mean a level, uh, a higher, uh, an oracle to a complete problem for the previous class. Then we're just going to define pi of i to be exactly as we uh, said it was going to be the co-class. Uh, co so this is going to be co-NP a co-non-deterministic machine given an oracle to sigma i minus 1 as well, right? Uh, and notice immediately, like, uh, sigma i is equal to np with an oracle for np. With an oracle for np and so on, right? So you get this, the machines, the oracle, it's not obvious what it means for an oracle to have power to another oracle. But certainly, this is believable. This has this occurs i times, and that pi of uh, i is equal to just the co uh, sigma i class. So you can define them that way as well. Instead of building off the previous class, you can just define it from its neighbor that way. And of course, co co a class is just the original class, right? So um, now the proper way to prove this would be by induction, right? Like, to prove that these two definitions are equivalent, we have a definition here in terms of alternating quantifiers, and then we have a definition here in terms of oracles. And it's not obvious that these are the same things. And the proper way to prove this would be by induction. So the base case is the same, right? The base case is the same for both. And what you would prove, uh, what you're supposed to prove, is like um, uh, the induction hypothesis would be sigma i is equal to exists pi i i minus 1, and um, pi i is equal to for all sigma i minus 1. If you could prove uh, using the oracle definition by induction, uh, both of these by adding these quantifiers in front of it, you would have proved Quite literally, you would prove the statement by induction because this would prove sigma and pi 2, sigma and pi 3, and so on follow the same definition. You would prove the oracle definition matches the definition uh, using these quantifiers. Instead of doing it that way, I'm going to, uh, the proof is not involved, but it is a little complicated. It's just a lot of moving parts because you have these, these machines, what is, a, what is an NP sigma i minus 1 oracle machine? Okay, This is a non-deterministic polynomial time machine with access to an oracle 
And the oracle can tell it problems from sigma i minus 1. And sigma i minus 1 is a class defined as exists for all, exists for all, so on i minus 1 times. Um, so it has this hypothetical, powerful, magical oracle, and also non-determinism. So it's got two superpowers that are moving in orthogonal directions. And the way you prove these is that you prove you can, like, you mix up the superpowers to simulate the other superpowers. Basically, that's what happens. Um, so what I'm going to actually prove is something much weaker, just to give you a hint about what this looks like. Uh, I'm going to kind of argue that sigma i is a subset of NP to the sigma i minus 1. And this is going to be using the definition of uh, the alternating quantifier predicate definition that we had. So what does this mean? Like, let, let L uh, be in sigma i, then uh, W is in L, uh, if and only if. Uh, well, sigma i is i quantifiers, right? So there exists x1 uh, for all x2, exists x3, right? Uh, Q xi, such that m, w, x1, xi, accepts, right? Now, here q is just whatever the last quantifier was, if it's even or odd. So I don't know if i is even, so we'll just write it that way. Uh, and these, these, these occur i times, right? Um, notice, though, that we have a subproblem here uh, immediately. We have uh, this is a subproblem without the existential quantification. And we can actually ask our sigma i oracle about this subproblem, because this is a negated sigma i minus 1 query. Um, this is a negated uh, sigma i minus 1 oracle query. Now, how do we fix this x1 part? We can just guess that using non-determinism. So, in fact, L being in sigma i means there's also a non-deterministic machine to solve L with, as long as we give that machine access to an oracle for sigma i minus 1. And that's enough to conclude that L is solvable by a non-deterministic polynomial time machine with oracle access to sigma i minus 1. And since L is any language in sigma i, we've concluded that sigma i is equal to that. Um, the reverse re re direction is slightly more involved, but you can kind of see how maybe some more of the meat in the gears about why the oracle definition is equivalent to the uh, other one, although it does, it does uh, require a formal proof. Any question on the oracle definition that we've given? Again, this first half is all definitions. It's not about you know, why we care about the oracle definition yet. All right, let's go on to the third definition. The third definition involves what are called alternating uh, Turing machines. So recall the computation path of a... Uh, non-deterministic machine, right? A non-deterministic machine is allowed to make branches and go into many worlds at once. And if one of those branches accepts, then we say it accepts. So an alternating Turing machine is like a non-deterministic Turing machine. However, it can choose what kind of non-deterministic jump it wants, whether it wants to do a non-deterministic one or a co-non-deterministic one. So what that means is, like, if we in the past have had a non-deterministic computation path, think of it like this, right? Maybe it's like that, right? At each step that it makes a, a non-deterministic jump, it really accepts if one branch accepts, right? So we can really put an existential quantifier here on each of these branches. So this is, an, this is the computation of a non-deterministic Turing machine, right? And it accepts if one branch accepts. Now, an, an alternating machine gets to choose what kind of branch it makes. So, for example, the first one could be a for all. And all of its branches would be required to accept. But then later down the line, it may make it an existential one. And then only one of those branches would be required to accept. Right? So let's say this was the branch system. Um, if this was an accept state and this was an accept state, then the machine would accept. Because it requires both branches to accept. So this branch accepts. This branch accepts because this one accepts. So this one accepts 
because this one accepts, even if this rejects. But then this one accepts because both of these accept. Right? So there's an immediate generalization here of alternating and non from non-determinism. Here it's allowed to do this kind of um, co-non-deterministic quantum uh, non-deterministic step, right, compared to a non, uh, deterministic one. So what do you think is the relationship between non-deterministic time and alternating uh, time, right? So uh, if n time, what is the relationship between n time of f of n and a time of f of n, where a time is alternating uh, a time of an alternating Turing machine, and n time is the time of a non-deterministic Turing machine. n time is a subset of a time? Every non-deterministic Turing machine is an alternating Turing machine, but there may be alternating Turing machines which are not non-deterministic Turing machines. So certainly then, by an immediate immediately we get the fact that NP, non-deterministic polynomial time, is a subset of alternating polynomial time. So AP, alternating polynomial time, special polynomial time. But it appears, actually, that this existential quantification is so much bigger because it also, co-NP is also a subset of AP, right? Why? Because the, you, while, while you can simulate a non-deterministic machine on an alternating machine by having only existential quantifiers, you can also simulate a co-non-deterministic machine on an alternating machine by having only universal quantifiers, right? So it actually also contains co-NP. And how big is AP? We actually know very a lot, quite a bit about alternating uh, classes. We have the following uh, three theorems, and I'm only going to prove one of them. We know that alternating logarithmic space is so big it's actually just polynomial time. We know that alternating polynomials time is actually just p space, and we know that uh, AP space, alternating polynomial space, is actually just. Um, XP time. So I'm going to just prove this second one, though, uh, um, just to give you a hint about what these terms look like. So how do I do that? I'm just going to show um, the relationship between AP and P space. If you want to prove two classes are the same, we, of course, have to use a double set containment. So how do we prove? that uh, P space first is a subset of AP. So alternating polynomial time by these magic machines that are generalized non-deterministic machines. Again, non-determinism is unrealizable. We're talking about totally made up machines. And now we have an even, ma even more made up machine because now it has two superpowers instead of one. How do we prove that P space is decidable on an alternating machine in polynomial time? About the graph, could it just be like one line sequentially? The computation graph of an alternating machine? Yes. So, like, um, for non deterministic, there's multiple branches, but for polynomial, there would just be one branch. Correct. So, could you just say one branch is just a more simplified version of an alternating machine? Sure, but, an ex but a polynomial. That's, that's very, actually, that's correct. But a polynomial uh, space machine may run in exponential time. Oh. So like the, the length of the graph in, in, in your analogy would be maybe exponentially long. But we want the alternating machine to run polynomial, still polynomial number steps. That would prove actually P space is a subset of AP space. Um, the answer is like TQBF is a P space complete problem. So whatever we can put TQBF, we can put uh, we can talk about p-space. So to prove this, we can just argue that TQBF has an algorithm for an alternating machine, uh, right? Because all of p-space, there's a polynomial time reduction from all of p-space to TQBF. So wherever we can put TQBF, we can combine it with a polynomial time reduction to get a polynomial time algorithm, right? Again, not a real algorithm because this alternating machine doesn't exist. But why would we think that TQBF is in a p-space? You remember the definition of AAP TQBF? TQBF was uh, true quantified Boolean formulas. It's a sequence of quantified formulas over SAT. AP also has ex existential, actually TQBF is in AP for the same reason that SAT is in NP. SAT is only existential quantifiers, and, and non-deterministic machine only makes existential branches. 
TQBS has universal and existential quantifiers, and the AP machine can make universal and existential branches, right? So that you, every time you come to a quantifier uh, in the TQBF formula, you just make a, the appropriate universal or existential branch, right? So like if you're if like like you had phi, exist phi ex, uh, for all exists for all phi, uh, which was a formula in TQBF then your AP machine would make a for all quantifying branch, then an exists one, and then a for all one again, right? So whatever the, the sequence of compositions are, you choose to branch based on that. So sort of like non-deterministically, you say I try all these possibilities simultaneously at once. Uh, here, it, it's kind of a similar idea, right? So certainly, uh, TQBF is an AP, and therefore, P space is a subset of AP. Uh, what about how do we prove that uh, AP is a subset of P space? So suppose I gave you a deterministic, excuse me, a non, -de non -de an alternating polynomial time thing. So it's got this weird algorithm. Super. How do you simulate it deterministically only using polynomial space? And looking for a very hand wavy, very, very hand wavy answer. So you have to give a reduction from AP to TQBF? You have a machine which is alternating polynomial time, and you can relate the machine to TQBF in a less direct way. So I guess the answer I'm looking for is that we proved that TQBF was in P-space because we proved it was P-space complete. So it's also P-space, hard P-space, and in, in P-space. We gave an algorithm that was a P-space algorithm for the TQBF. And it turns out, since AP is really nicely looking like TQBF, you can probably copy and paste that algorithm for TQBF to be an algorithm to simulate the P-space, the AP machine. So when the AP machine makes a branch, so do you. And you do so deterministically. But you reuse the space in a way that's kind of like Savage's theorem. Like, if you recall, um, whenever we, for the TQBF, whenever we made, an, uh, we made a recursive call, whenever we saw a universal or existential quantification, we, we made two recursive calls that ran sequentially to reuse space. And then if it was a, uni a universal quantifier, we had to and the outputs of the, both those calls to make sure they both returned true. And if it was existential, we had to or them, so at least one of them returned true. That was, and that algorithm, because it allowed the recursive calls to reuse the space and only leave one bit on the tape when they return, you know, the whole stack pops in and out. Only one bit is at the last call. Uh, it doesn't, the, the space gets reused very efficiently, and then we only had a polynomial space algorithm for TQBF. Similarly, we have a polynomial space algorithm for AP, right? So TQBF, because AP does equal P space, uh, TQBF is an AP complete problem as well. So AP and, T and P space are related. Now, why did I go on this tangent when I'm talking about the polynomial hierarchy? Well, it turns out that um, uh, AP is very, uh, not AP, but the, but the polynomial, uh, the alternating machine appears in some bounded way to be related to the levels of the polynomial hierarchy. So we, we, we define uh, sigma i time of f of n to be a uh, class of languages decidable by an f of n alternating machine, uh, which such that the first, uh, where the first, the first magic ability, it has two magic abilities, right? The existential and the universal one. The first magic step is an existential one, and it makes no more than i of them. So in some sense, sigma i time is like alternating time, except the machine is not allowed to do them to arbitrary depth. It can only do uh, these magic steps up to depth i on its computation. So in some sequence, it can only do as much as i, and we use sigma i to denote that the first one 
was an existential step. Similarly, we define pi of i time. Uh, similarly, it's an f of n time alternating machine. It only makes uh, quantification steps up to step i, and it starts with a universal quantifier, right? So, something like that, right? Imagine I copied and pasted that. Well, the levels of polynomial hierarchy can be defined via these alternating machines as well. We can define sigma i to be equal to the union of k equals 0 to infinity of sigma i time um, n to the k. And uh, pi of i is equal to k equals 0 to infinity of pi of i time uh, n to the k. So basically, if your alternating machine runs in polynomial time and makes as most i steps, then it decides a language in sigma i or pi i, depending on which quantifier comes first. So the alternating machines clearly, uh, the bounded alternating machines clearly also capture the levels of the polynomial hierarchy. Now, this, of course, is a third definition and requires as much proof as the second one. Uh, but why am I not proving, the, proving this one as well? I'm going to instead prove... Um, like uh, sigma 1 is equal to uh, sigma 1 time poly. So what's the difference between these? All right, that should be good enough. Um, here's the problem. Uh, an alternating Turing machine, by definition, of sigma one time, makes one query, one universal query. A non-deterministic machine is allowed to make multiple. They all have to be existential quantifier, quantifying, but they, the non-deterministic machine is allowed to make more than one query. Um, excuse, not query, but like jump, magic jump. This can make one jump. It has to be existential. This is allowed to make many jumps. Um, but if you've noticed, any time we've actually talked about a non-deterministic machine performing this jump, we say the machine non-deterministically guesses the satisfying assignment or something like that. We've only ever done one jump. So what we can do, basically to give a hint towards this being true, what we can do is we define, suppose we had a non-deterministic machine that looked like this. So it made some existential quantification, and then it made some other existential quantifications. The difference between multiple existential quantifications and one is that the future guesses it makes may be dependent each step of a computation. The real trouble of anything in computer science is that the future computation is dependent on all previous steps, right? So the non-deterministic guessing that's done in the future is dependent upon non-deterministic guessing that occurred in the past. But what the fix around this is like, it doesn't matter, it turns out. Although it seems like it matters, because there's this dependency, turns out it doesn't matter because you can also just guess the guesses. So the answer is if this was a non-deterministic machine, you can have an equivalent uh, AP, A sigma one time machine that does the, its computation path looks like this. That's the answer. So here you were recording, you maybe you made two, three guesses uh, for this. Instead, you just guess everything at once, right? So what's the difference between guessing a SAT formula in one step versus guessing each bit of the, SAT for, uh, the SAT assignment, right? This, you would guess each bit of the SAT assi assignment. Here, you just guess the entire assignment at once. Turns out it doesn't matter. So that's kind of a hint towards why sigma 1, which is NP, is like sigma 1 time of an alternating machine. These are three definitions of the polynomial hierarchy. Polynomial hierarchy, again, very weird, very alien device. This is just a class on definitions, and we haven't really done any proofs with it yet, but we've talked about what this weird kind of, I mean, look at that, you know. Uh, my, I love doing this topic last because this is supposed to be a computer science course, but it makes me feel like a wizard. Okay, I drew some sort of, uh, you know, like when they do this chalk in the spell circle or something. You show this to an engineer, I don't know what would happen, you know. Uh, it's totally made up. It's totally just creative, uh, a waste of time in some sense. Um, but next time we'll talk about, any questions on the definition before we talk about how cool the polynomial hierarchy is and why we care? We only talked about the definition just now. These three definitions we've loosely related to each other. Oracles, alternating machines, 
and alternating quantifiers of predicates. Cool. 